my computer. Okay, I think we can go now. All right. <laughs> it's been a rough start this morning doing this in my office and it anyway it doesn't work that well here so hopefully this recording is better than the last one i did and uh but underway so if you're not aware the first recording i made the audio was awful so we're doing it again Nora's home uh, we've been out for walks we've been out to this place recently but this actually i think is an old photo from last year that uh, this is Macintosh single track trails. It's for mountain bikers. I'm not a bike, mountain biker, we walk, <laughs> but it's a beautiful trail system out near JL Wilsley High School. And we're up on a fairly high hill here, as is most of this area, very high. And looking over Colpitts Lake and out beyond it, that building right in the background there is St. Mary's High Rise. So let's get started here. There we go. So we got our last test coming up on Friday. And uh, hopefully it's better than previous tests. Uh, in the past, students have done reasonably well. Though one of the other instructors has just pointed out several errors I made in designing the test. So I got to fix it up before I get it posted and check it again. Uh, chapter 11, that's uh, what we're doing right now is the uh, quiz is due on Saturday, then you'll have one more quiz. Remember that your grade's based upon your best 10 quizzes. So if you've got 10 that you've done really well on, you don't have to do any more actually. Oh, I'd like you to do it. It's a good idea. Helps to retain information. That you're here not to get a grade, but hopefully to learn something. <laughs> but I know the grade is what you need. Uh, okay, there's the fall feedback survey. I'm gonna put out a reminder, I uh, probably won't get time until tonight to get that out. We've got about 85 rent responses really picked up after I prodded you asking, should we have a final exam in the course? No, there's no going back, there's no final. But uh, it did stimulate response, uh, poked you a little bit. You have to poke people to get people uh, to get them to answer surveys. The course evaluation, uh, we tried it in class on Monday. It didn't work. There were all kinds of technical difficulties. Uh, I am told now that they have resolved those and that it should be functioning. Uh, yesterday it was functioning properly. I'll do it in class today. I ask you to do it. It isn't so much for me. And if you don't do it for this class, it's not the end of the world, but do it for all your other courses. We need that information. Uh, Friday, my day's taken up with motion reviews for faculty members. And these are important uh, uh, inputs we use to evaluate teaching effectiveness. And it's the only objective method we have available to us to uh, evaluate how students perceive the effectiveness of teaching. So please fill them out, we need it. And we got one more week and we're all finished. Hey, that's good. So again, Course evaluations, course feedback survey, really important stuff. For me, it's the feedback survey on this course. I've got two issues that, th there's several issues that I try to raise in the survey to get your feedback. And I'm written for written answers. I'm not looking for scoring things or yes, no's. That we're using Top Hat. I think we're the only ones on campus using it. Uh, you had to pay an access fee because the university doesn't have a license for it. Uh, I'm actually getting pushback from the university that I'm not supposed to be using it. I'm supposed to be doing everything in Brightspace. But Brightspace, uh, back again, guys. Um, okay, I think it, does it actually say my recording is still going? Uh, yes, it is still recording. <laughs> But I'm lost and I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Don't ask me why this happens. You would think working on doing this on campus, we'd have better success, but actually it doesn't work when I use it in my office. Anyway, back to this. Um, so with Top Hat, I like using it. It's a lot easier for me to build stuff in Top Hat than in Brightspace. Uh, 
And there are some things I can do in class with live teaching that I can't do in Brightspace. But I don't know about you with online, it really makes a difference to you. So I'd like your feedback on that. You're a different group from those that are on campus. That the other thing is, <laughs> this has come up especially with assignment four. I got a lot of late assignments I accepted. Should I be doing that? Should I be allowing late assignments to be submitted? Should I be allowing students to make up tests that they missed? That, oh, I forgot. I write it a few days later. That uh, what should we be doing about that type of thing? What's your view on it? Is it really fair? So you can tell me. Here are a few questions that are applicable to the test coming up. These are tough questions, some of them, and they're from old tests and I'm not using them anymore, but they're good things to prod you. Bayes rule. Bayes rule was from probability. Now that is on the test, although I'm not sure if I'd ask this question, but this was one having to do with naive Bayes, that classification method. So what is Bayes rule? Is Bayes rule, the probability of A and B is the probability of A given B times probability of B. Is it the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A? Uh, is it A given B is probability of B given A, probability of A divided by probability of B, or none of the above? Okay. So what are these ones? The very first one, that equation is correct. It's our multiplication rule. Uh, Bayes rule is based upon that. Actually, uh, but its Bayes rule is more complicated than just the multiplication rule. So A is not correct, but in answer to this question, but the formula itself is correct. It's presented there. The formula in B looks like a rearrangement of the formula in A. Okay, but notice that it would sort of look like A if you took that last probability of B and brought it over to the other side, divided both sides by probability of B, then you'd have that, basically that same equation, okay? But you'll notice that the answer in B has you dividing by probability of A, not probability of B. The formula in B is an incorrect formula. It's nothing, it's an incorrect formula. It's definitely a wrong answer. The right answer is C. Bayes rule is a tool for taking statements like probability of B given A and flip it around to A given B. Okay, so first thing to know about Bayes rule is it does that flip, okay, uh, from one to the other, reverses that sequence. But the other thing is the formula has to be correct. And so when you see probability B given A, you should generally be multiplying by probability of A. So that whatever is in the second part of that expression, that conditional probability is what you multiply by. And then it was correct, divide by probability of B. So C is the correct answer. How about another one? Uh, what about independent events? This is an assumption we need for naive Bayes is that certain things are independent. But, um, what does that really mean? Now this again is stuff from chapter nine on probability. Is it if A happens, sorry, um, I'll give you, there's four statements here. Three of them are correct. One of them is false. Okay. So if A happens, then it will have no impact on the chance of B happening. If A happens, then B cannot occur. Probability of A given B equals probability of A. Probability of A and B. It's probability A times probability of B. A is a correct description of what independence means. That knowing something about A gives you no information about B. Your assessment of B occurring does not change when you know something about A. Okay. That That's actually the same type of thing that happens in C. An answer C, it says probability of A given B is probability of A. 
So knowing about B doesn't change your assessment of the probability of A. So that, again, is a correct statement. And if two events are independent, our multiplication rule simplifies to what you've got in the answer D. So what's that answer B mean? It says if A happens, then B cannot happen. So if you know A happened, you also know that B didn't happen. So knowing about A tells you about B. That means they can't be independent. <laughs> it also means they're mutually exclusive. The answer B is a description of mutually exclusive, not of independence. But many people get confused on that. So naive Bayes, what is it? It assumes that the predictor variables are mutually exclusive. It has similar data limitations to decision trees. It can result in probability estimates that exceed one or none of the above. Well, first off, no, the predictor variables aren't mutually exclusive. The predictor variables are independent of each other. So that I'm trying to predict whether or not you're going to renew your car insurance, and I'm looking at gender and age, those things are related to whether or not you're going to renew. But age and gender are independent. Knowing if someone is a female doesn't tell me anything about age. Knowing they're a male doesn't tell me anything about age. They're quite separate from each other. B has similar data limitations to decision trees. No. Once we make that assumption that age and, independ and, and gender are independent, then when looking at males under 50, I can look first at males and all the data on gender, and then I can look at all the information um, about gender. That, that I could look at those, those two variables completely separately and use all the data to look at them, instead of having to look at that, just that subgroup of males under 50 or males under 50 that had an accident last year, or males under 50 that had an accident last year and drove an SUV, uh, that I don't have to split into subgroups. And so I don't have the problem of, of data problems, uh, of samples getting too small in decision trees. So that's one of the nice things about naive bees, is I don't have the limitations of decision trees. And result in probability, estimates that exceed one. No, actually we use all the standard probability formulas under independence and we get reasonable probabilities that come out or they're, they're between zero and one. We can't get values that exceed one or get below zero. So all three answers are incorrect. None of the above is the right answer. Now when you use naive Bayes, we have a term called lift. That's one of the part of the expressions we get. And is it the same as correlation coefficients, but for binary variables? It increases the probability of a target outcome. It goes from minus one to plus one, or reduces the probability of the target outcome if it's less than one. It's similar in concept to what correlation is, but the numbers you get are quite different. Lift can go from zero to infinity, no limit on it, uh, whereas correlation goes from minus one to plus one. Generally, it means if the lift is a really big number, it increases the probability, and if it's a very, very small number, it may reduce probability. So it's not quite like slope being positive or negative, but it's similar in terms of scaling things. Uh, it increases the probability of the target outcome. Yes, it can, if the lift is bigger than one. If the lift is bigger than one, it will scale the probabilities up. If the lift is less than one, it'll scale those probabilities down. Okay? That it goes from minus one to plus one. No, it only goes, it starts at zero. It's up. Uh, in regression, things are additive terms. So we add or subtract something. With lift, we multiply by something. So we scale things up or down by multiplying by something. So C is incorrect. 
it reduces the probability of the target outcome if it's less than one. That's correct. So if you multiply by a lift that is 0.6, then that probability is going to be reduced. It, we're only going to take 60% of it. We're going to scale it down. So uh, the correct answer is D. Okay. So um, measuring success in classification, I gave you a whole bunch of measures of accuracy that sort of for success. One was one we call accuracy, percentage of classifications that are correct. It's like the, your grade on a true-false test. What percentage of questions did you answer correctly? Is it sensitivity? That's of the correct answers, of the, the positive answers, how many did you get correct? So uh, with people renewing their insurance, among those that did renew, how many did you guess correctly? And specificity is the negative side of that, of the people that did not renew their insurance. How many of them did you guess correctly? So of those, it's like looking at two groups. And so what was your accuracy on the first group, ones that renewed? And what was your accuracy on that second group, those that didn't renew, the positives and the negatives? False omission rate, that's the percentage that we're looking at that are mistakes in these other two. Of those that you classified that were negative, that were actually positive. So the, you expected them, you predicted that they would not renew, but they in fact did renew. That would be like with a COVID test that you thought, oh, you don't have uh, COVID, but actually they did. How many of those did you miss? False discovery rate is the other way around. It's those that you predicted would be positive that turned out to be negative, that you gave, got a positive test result, positive test of cancer with your mammogram, but actually they don't have cancer. You just scared the bejesus out of the woman in saying, oh, I think you've got cancer, when actually she doesn't. How often does that happen? That's the false discovery rate. So it's focusing on the mistakes. Now, positive and negative. Which, which is positive, which is negative? It's arbitrary. It's up to you. You define that. Okay. So when we were looking at, was a credit card transaction fraudulent or valid? I made the valid ones positive. I could have made the fraud ones positive. Okay. But uh, good was a valid transaction and uh, I accepted the valid ones. That was predicting positive. With COVID, when we did testing on that, that we treated COVID as a positive test result. Same thing happened with the mammograms. Generally with medical tests that were testing for a disease, and a positive outcome is a positive test result, okay? That says, I think you've got the disease. And with the insurance, I was viewing positive as being a good news thing that you are gonna renew your insurance and prediction of you know, a positive outcome. You'll notice the way I've set up the table. I also am associating an action generally with the prediction. So if I'm predicting a credit card transaction is valid, then I'm accepting the credit card transaction. I'm predicting it's fault, it's fraud, I'm rejecting it. With COVID, we were telling people to go into quarantine or if it was a negative test, we said, do nothing, you're good. Um, with renewing the insurance, got to figure out if, if what would the insurance company do if they predicted you're going to renew? Would they do anything or just assume, yeah, big deal. Um, we're going to get our money out of that person. If they thought you were going to switch insurance companies, that would they try to offer you an incentive, change your mind? Do they even care? Actually, I've never seen an insurance company care. <laughs> um, that, so that positive, negative, that's up for you. Um, sorry, definitive. Definition, I should have said, a positive, negative. Um, but you've got to be clear on which it is because you have to define what's a false positive, what's a true positive, those types of things. And that's going to affect your, your performance measures because the way you're defining sensitivity is in terms of positives. 
But um, still, what's success to you? Is that making correct decisions? Most of the time you're making correct decisions, that you're not making any bad decisions, that uh, you're rejecting the fraudulent transactions, if that's is that what you want. Do you want a low false discovery rate, um, that a very small percentage of quarantine people uh, not having COVID, that, uh, that you're generally being positive, or do you want false omission rate uh, to be really low that uh, the if you reject a transaction that a very very small percentage are actually valid that the uh, when you're saying someone doesn't have covid that they really don't have covid that you're making very few mistakes there that they're not slipping through you're catching the bad guys is that your your focus you want to catch as many of the fraud as you can i don't know there are a whole bunch of these things that are hard to figure out what's most important to you. Maybe several of those things are, you'd like all of them. That remember when looking at it, that these different measures like sensitivity and specificity, like looking at percentage of column total and the false omission rate and false discovery rate are looking at percentage of row total. If you remember when we did pivot tables, so we're hard things to understand. They're also the same as conditional probabilities. You want the probability of A given B or B given A. And we get confused on the two. We've actually covered this topic three times now. <laughs> that conditional probability, first with pivot tables, though we didn't call it probability, then we did it formally, called them probability. Now we're looking at an application and we're describing the as different performance measures. And it's probably no clearer now than it was at the very beginning. How do I make up my mind? Should I look at the columns or should I look at the rows? It's hard to make the right choice. That this isn't easy. Right? So if you're confused, don't worry about it. That, but it's trying to figure out which one should we use or which combination of them. And, and for many people, it's they struggle with that. So here's another one approach for you, though, that might be a little bit better, particularly when we're making an awful lot, a very, very large number of repetitive decisions. So we know we're going to ha have to make some mistakes. And we have some information about the consequences of mistakes we make. And actually, I'm going to look at cases where we can evaluate the consequences financially. And then we might take a different approach. Might make sense to you, might not. First, I've got to introduce an idea, concept called expected value. So this one, I don't have a decision model here. I'm just going out and doing some marketing. I'm firing off a promotion to each potential customer. And the cost to go and solicit or attract this customer, I'm using some third party service and I'm being charged 10 cents for each customer that's contacted. Now, if they end up buying my product, that after costs, all the costs are taken into account, I still end up with a profit of $15. So it's really good if I can sell it. But if they don't buy it, then I've wasted 10 cents. So I only want to send it to people that are going to buy it, I would think. And it turns out only one in 100 people want to buy my product. So it's only 1% want to buy it. Is this promotion really a good idea? Well, we can crunch some numbers here. Let's imagine 100,000 customers. Right? What would I expect to see with 100,000 customers? Well, I would expect a thousand of them to buy it, one percent, and a thousand at fifteen dollars each is fifteen thousand dollars in profit. Good stuff. But I'd also expect ninety-nine thousand not to buy it, and for them, I've lost ten cents each. Small amount of money, but ninety-nine thousand times. And when you multiply that through, you get nine thousand nine hundred dollars, almost ten thousand dollar loss on those customers. So combining the two. I've got a net profit of $5,100. So I'm ahead. The promotion works. 
that I am making money on a per customer basis. I could say on average, I'm making about five cents, 0.051, five cents per customer. Well, I don't make five cents from any customer. I either lose 10 cents or I make a profit of $15, but the average is five cents. Okay? So average may not reflect anybody. Part of my complaint before about using averages, averages may not represent anybody. This thing is generally called expected value. And it's written as a capital E with your variable that you're studying profit uh, in brackets. And the formula for it is that squiggly thing means the sum of, it's a Greek letter sigma, and it means add up each possible outcome, the value of it, times the probability of that outcome. We've only got two outcomes. Some problems could have many different outcomes. So we'd have outcome times probability, outcome times probability, and so on. And so with this one, we make a profit of $15 with a probability of 0.01, 1% by it. And we have a loss of uh, minus 0.1 and that probability of that is 99%, 0.99. So you multiply that through and you get the 0 0.051. That was my average profit per customer. Okay. So expected value is the average value for just one person. All right, sort of okay. Again, you may want to just try reasoning it out like we did before. Imagine 100,000 customers, like we've been doing probability before. Work with some frequency data and then scale it appropriately. So you're talking about one customer. It's a really popular measure, especially in finance, of measuring um, expected returns on investments. So the, in the previous example, I sent the promotion to everybody. Suppose I've got historical data on customers okay, that I sent promotion to before, and I want to know, should I go and do that type of thing again? And I did it as an experiment on 100,000 customers and wondered, well, could I do better than that? So I built a model that tried to predict who would be the customers that would likely buy it and who would not likely buy it. And I'd only send the promotion to those I thought would buy it. So my model identified 2,000 customers that were likely buyers and said the other 98,000 are not worth my time. Okay. That, so if I had applied the model on that, what sort of outcomes would I get? Here's the confusion matrix that I've got. And it says that of the 2,000 I sent it to, 902 bought it. That's most of those that would buy it. 1,000 was the total I bought. But I had almost 1,100 that didn't buy it. So I got a lot wrong too. With respect to those that I didn't send the promotion to, analyzing my training data on that, I've got 98,000 of them didn't buy it, but almost 100 of them did. And so I would have missed those if I didn't send the promotion out to them. So is this a good idea? That I could summarize my, I've written this as a probability table. It's like a confusion matrix here. And I've put in what are the expected profits here. So I would only make a profit or make a loss with those I sent the promotion to. So those are in that send promo row. The ones I do not send the promo to, they don't know about the product or the special, and so they didn't buy it. And also I didn't send them anything, so I didn't lose anything with those ones. So if you go and add up each of the outcome values times their probabilities, what do we get? Well, if you do all of that, you end up with an expected profit of $0.1342. So about 13, 13 and a half cents instead of five cents. This is per customer, okay? That 
that I send the promo to, it's actually a lot better profit. It's more than double. It's almost three times as much. So the classification model really does work. Um, and if I look at its performance measures on sensitivity, I, I'm, right, I'm right about 90% of the time. Of those that buy the product, I identified 90% of them. So we get most of the profit. And of those that would not buy the profit, I didn't send it to most of them, 99% of them. So in that respect, I've got both my sensitivity and specificity look really, really good. So it should work well. And then this, when I attach the dollar figures to it, it's also really working well. This one as well, I'm not sure if I'm if I care that much about false discovery rate uh, or false omission rate, that my mistakes are not of huge consequences, it seems. So what about ones where I've got outcomes where there are consequences, more of a consequence to more of the cells in the table? So let's look at the credit card case. So. This was one we had before, where we had a model trying to detect whether or not a credit card transaction was valid or fraudulent. And it was good at doing some things, but it also, we had problems with those, particularly the ones that we rejected that and didn't approve the transactions. We could get customers that were very upset with us and, that seemed to be a very negative outcome. Let's look at this and look at those different consequences because they're now I'm going to get four different sorts of consequences. So first off, a valid transaction and you approve it. What happens then? Well, those things are profitable to you that retailers pay a commission, a, a fee of about two and a half percent to Visa or MasterCard for uh, letting a customer use that service. So if you bought something for uh, $500, then what do we got? We've got about $12.50 is gonna go to Visa from the retailer as a fee on that. They're gonna make money off that. In addition, you spent $500, are you gonna pay that off at the end of the month? Well, a lot of people, the reason they put it on their credit card, well, some of them put it on to get points. Others, because I don't have $500 right now. And at the end of the month, oh, I got $150. I'll put that down on my visa bill. But I'll try to pay the rest of it next month or maybe the month after that. So they're paying in installments. They're going to end up paying interest at 29% interest rate. That adds up quite quickly. So a valid transaction that's approved generates potentially a lot of profit for Visa or MasterCard. Let's suppose it works out to be $12 per transaction on average. I don't know what number is, but let's pick a number. That a fraudulent transaction though is gonna be a problem. And uh, that uh, when I detected it with my credit card, that Visa ended up, or my bank, uh, they were out a couple thousand dollars. So on average, how much gets is it comes up with fraud? Let's suppose it's just $500 on average uh, before it's caught or stopped or something like that. Now, if you reject the transaction, what happens? Well, if you reject a fraudulent one, nothing. The, the transaction didn't happen. You didn't lose anything. You didn't make any money. So it's zero. Okay. But what about the valid transaction you rejected? Okay, you didn't make any money on that. There was no fraud there. But you've got a customer that's very upset. What if they switch? What if they go to and start saying, fine, I'm not going to go with TD Bank anymore. I'm going to go to Scotiabank or Bank of Montreal, something else. Uh, they're gonna, you're going to take their business away. And in doing so, the bank's going to lose money. And you might be generating profit for them, $100, $200, $300 a year. That, um, so over 
lifetime. That's a lot of money. How much should we assign as a value to an upset customer? Not everyone will switch credit card companies, but on average, what's your losses due to getting an, a customer upset? I don't know. Bank probably doesn't know. Let's put a number on it though. Let's put $50 on it. Now we've got stuff we can go and go through our model and work out what is the expected profit. So I can, all of these ones, we had probabilities from that confusion matrix and I can assign all these dollars. I make a profit of over $10 per transaction. Well, that sounds actually really, really good. But like the marketing example I had a minute ago, what's the base case? What if I didn't use a model at all? In the marketing case, we sent the marketing promotion to every customer. In this one, suppose I approve every transaction. I don't reject anybody. It's my, I don't have a data mining model tell me that I should reject some. What would be the profit then? So 99% of the transactions are valid, and I make a $12 profit on each of those. 1% are fraudulent, and I lose 500 on each of those. I put it in. The expected value is... $6.88. So, hey, the model, I'm making an extra $3 and something per transaction. That's going to add up to an awful lot of money. So, yes, the model looks to be really, really good. Yeah. If the numbers I put into it were good, maybe I can believe the probabilities because it's historical data on 100,000 customers. So, I'm not worried about that. But do you really trust all the other numbers I put in? Where did they come from? Well, the profit and the loss, both of those you should be able to get from your accounting data. You've got data about the customers and that about what fees you're charging merchants and the like. You should be able to work out a profit per transaction on based upon fees and interest. And you should also have data on fraud ones where you had to do a refund to the customer and what were your losses on those and what was the average loss. So those two numbers, you've got data and you should be able to measure accurately. But the goodwill of $50, we just made it up. Why 50? That maybe I should have used 100. Maybe I should have used 25. I don't know. But if I used 100, then those rejected ones would be a bigger cost to me. And so my profit would be, expected profit is probably lower. So what figure should I use? Uh, that, because hmm. I'm not sure about the 50. Now, do you think it might be 100? Do you think it might be 200? Do you think it might be 500? I don't know. You might have some feel, but you may not know the number exactly. We could try doing some tricks with this. You can do sensitivity analysis and do it trial and error, try different values and see which one, uh, when is the model good and when is the model not good. Or you could actually, if there's only one thing you don't know, you've got the do nothing solution that makes a profit of $6.88 of approving every transaction. And then you've got your data mining solution but it needs a goodwill value put in there because you're going to reject some good transactions. But you're only missing one thing. So you've got one equation and one unknown. You should be able to solve for that unknown. I did it. And I got the value of goodwill as being $392. That's a big number. Uh, maybe it's still too low. I don't know. But it's saying if the value of upsetting a customer is less than $392, if it's even $200 or $250 or $300, it's still better to use the model and reject some transactions. On the other hand, if that value is more like $500, then no, it's better to just approve everybody and have to eat the cost of, of fraudulent loans and so on, because the cost of losing goodwill is so high.
Okay? But it gives you an idea of, you think the number should be above or below? And management should be able to make some guess then as to which way to go. So generally with expected value, we need to have those dollar figures to put into the formula. And as I said, sometimes we've got everything, but sometimes we don't. That if there's only one thing missing, then we can do this type of sensitivity analysis I just did. If there's several that are missing, it becomes difficult to justify using expected value because it's too iffy and you're making things up. As I said, this is for repetitive decisions, making them over and over and over again. And that's what generally data mining is about. Because like with this one, it was based upon all right, training data had 100,000 previous cases. So there were 100,000 previous decisions that we had data for. So this is a very repetitive decision-making situation. There are a lot of times when we as individuals, the company may make lots and lots of decisions, but as individuals, we only make one or two, or it's infrequent. And our attitude and our approach is quite different when that's the case than when it's a repetitive one. That when we can't average things out, it turns out, and this is going to come up next week when we get into deployment. Deployment is implementing your solution. You can't implement it if management doesn't accept it. So you've done all your analysis, you present your report, and they say, thank you very much, but we're not going to use it. That's really disappointing. <laughs> it's very expensive because you spend a lot of time and money building that solution for them. That why are they rejecting it? Well, some of them, it's because they don't understand what you've done. You haven't communicated it well. One of the things you're trying to communicate is the risks that are involved in making decisions. And they don't understand risk. So you may have an audience that has a poor understanding of risk. We've already seen that with doctors that don't understand probability. So it's really common that they don't understand. So the way you phrase it, present it, it's going to be really important in how you do this. And their understanding of risk, often they don't understand the difference between risks when you're making decisions, millions of them, little ones, and when you're making one big life-changing decision. It's all the same. It's all risk to them. So here's some things. That... Let's look at one where you're making it frequently. Suppose, and this is an experiment that's been done many times in classrooms with students to try to get them to understand risk. If I flipped a loony in class and that I said, I'm gonna flip it a hundred times. And if it comes up heads, I'm gonna pay you $2. But if it comes up tails, you're gonna have to pay me $1. Would you take the bet? And you should very quickly say, yeah, I'll take the bet because you're probably going to make a good chunk of money on this. That Think about it. That the expected value, so the chance that you're going to get $2 is 50%, and the chance you're going to pay me a dollar is also 50%, 0.5. So the expected value is 0.5 times 2 minus 0.5 times 1, or an answer 0.5, 50 cents. On average, on each flip, you should expect to make a profit of 50 cents. That's on average. Sometimes you'll pay me a dollar, sometimes I'll pay you two dollars, but the average return to you is 0.5. Okay, so that's good. And on 100 flips, that's 50 dollars. But if I change it, and say, ah, it's going to take too much time. Let's just get this all over with at once. I'm going to flip the coin once. And if it comes up heads, I'll pay you $200. Comes up tails, you pay me $100. It's got the same expected profit as, you know, 100 flips, $50. You expect to make a profit of $50. Would you take the bet? Well, we find some will take the bet, some won't. A lot of them won't. That, why? 
Well, if you can't afford to lose $100, you're not going to take the bet. That there's risk involved here. That there's a lot more uncertainty, a lot more risk involved when we do it on one uh, flip instead of spreading it over 100 flips. You're seeing this in this course. That in the past, this course would have had a final exam where 50% of your grade. And so 50% of your grade depends upon what happens on one day writing one exam. Big risk, very stressful. You've got 40% of your grade on tests, not 50%, and it's on five tests. So each one's worth only eight points. Still a lot of points, but it still spreads the risk out. And that it the overall risk to you of doing poorly in the course is reduced. So there's the hopefully the expected return, the expected performance might be the same on average, but the chance of doing really poorly, of failing, gets reduced. Okay? But um, this is important. In the area of finance, this idea of expected return and risk and the trade-off between the two uh, to invest in uh, technology businesses. A lot more risk in it, but much higher returns. Investing in, in some utilities, and real estate, or that sort of thing, very often there's much less risk, but the returns are much lower. That, so where do you put your money? You've got a trade-off between risk and return. That, um, but there's a lot more to it in terms of the psychology that's going on behind the scenes, okay? And that's in the way we present an opportunity and how we're phrasing it to people and how their behavior changes. So if I gave you a situation where you're not gonna lose anything, you're either gonna make $6,000 or you're gonna get nothing. And you'll get $6,000 with a probability of 0.45. So it's quite high. Um, that 45% chance, almost 50% chance. Or would you take $3,000 with a probability of 90%. So still, you might get nothing. But there's a very, very high probability you'll get $3,000. Which would you take? Well, when we do that as an experiment with students, we get more picking the 3,000 than 6,000. Why? Well, I'm almost guaranteed to get $3,000. That's a lot of money. It's free. It's extra. Um, would I really gamble to go and get twice that amount of money or get nothing? And in many instances, people will say, I'll take the sure thing. That uh, on game shows where they say, okay, you've, got, you've won $7,000 now. Nope. You're willing to go into another round and potentially double your money? And, or do you want to walk away now with your $7,000? And many people would say, mm, I'll gamble, I'll gamble. And they've got some number in their head. If they hit 20,000, then they're going to walk away. Um, but there's that sort of trade-off there. And people, they like that sure thing. So let's change it. Let's change the problem only in the probabilities that you can get twice as much money but the risk is the probability of winning it is only half. And so, but I'm changing the numbers. Instead of it being a 55% chance of getting $6,000, it's only a chance of 1,000.1%. Or we can double that probability of winning to 0.2% and reduce the payoff to $3,000. These have the same expected value. If you put them into our formula, you'll get the same expected value of both. Which one would you choose? Sounds like the same experiment we just did, but the behavior ends up being different. Most will gamble. And that's the logic behind lotteries. That if there is a huge, if the probability of winning is very small, then 
people aren't that interested. But if the payoff is really big, they'll buy the lotto ticket. So we see with with um, Lotto Max and uh, 649, as the jackpot gets bigger, more people are willing to go and gamble on that very small chance they're going to win. Payoff is big. But they wouldn't normally gamble if the payoff wasn't really big. So um, they don't really have any sense of chance of one in a thousand and one in 500 of winning. Uh, we can't relate to that. So our, there's a whole bunch of literature on the psychology of risk. Not every time are we rational. We'll take risks in some cases with a, and not take risks in others. So our, our behavior is different. And it doesn't seem to be clear when we're risk takers and when we're not risk takers. We're not consistent in our behavior. The reason it's important is that if this, if you can rephrase it in such a fashion that the your client doesn't see it as being so risky, they're more willing to accept. It. And there are ways of phrasing things sometimes so that they, you're emphasizing the negative, <laughs> and sometimes when you're emphasizing the positive, careful how you phrase things that you may turn off your audience, and this is going to be really important. So um, anyway, let's wrap this up. When you're evaluating a project, you should be doing it all the time. Always checking to see, are you on time, are you on budget? And in particular, have the objectives changed? Are they the same as what you started with? That you should also be evaluating the process. Because when, more often than not, if you're gonna have to do other projects, they're gonna be different, but they're gonna have a lot of similarities. Mistakes you made last time, try to avoid making them the next time. Things that you did particularly well last time, try to do them again the next time. Reflect on what you've done. That's why I do the free feedback survey in the course. I want to know what's working in this course and what's not working. And you're the only one that can really tell me from your perspective what's working and not. I see some things from my end that are working and are not. But I need your perspective on that. And so I do that to do that sort of evaluation at the end for the next time I have to teach. So it's just like doing projects. That the um, when we're looking at models and we're doing the evaluation, we're looking at performance measures and that we're making predictions. And predictions are always wrong, sometimes at least. That, that you're sometimes right, sometimes wrong. When you're wrong, sometimes it's by a little bit, sometimes by a lot. We need some way of measuring how well we're doing. And there are different ways of doing that. With classification, we saw a whole bunch of different measures, and there are other ones as well. And if you're reading book, other books about this, they sometimes give them different names than this. Um, there are a lot of different jargon out there. There's no consistency at the moment on what to call all of these different measures of performance. And it gets really confusing. Expected value at least is one standard and it's a common measure, but it it helps in some contexts and it doesn't in others. It, it, it is useful though, that uh, average performance and the like. But we've gotta be careful. We're not always rational, okay? And we see things from different perspectives with uh, your discussion question we've got having to do with vaccination. Public health wanted everybody to get a vaccination because if everybody did, then the transmission of COVID would be reduced quite dramatically, they felt, and because you couldn't catch it if someone wasn't able to transmit it to you because they were vaccinated. They, if, if people don't have it, then they can't transmit it. So the vaccines would help in reducing that type of thing. And so from a societal perspective, the best idea was to have everybody vaccinated. Now, others might argue there are side effects to a vaccination and there are side effects to all kinds of different things. There are um, some of the public health measures and quarantining and lockdowns and restricting number of people in a restaurant like had a whole bunch of negative consequences. 
So on the individual level, you're feeling the negative consequences there. And you're going to make a decision. Yeah, that may be good for society as a whole, but it may give me a personal risk or a business having to restrict customers. Yeah, that may be good for society, but it's going to drive me out of business. And so there, the one measure is for the average for society as a whole. But then you're thinking about the one-time situation with yourself. And there were many businesses that were upset because it was going to drive them out of business. That or individuals, they felt it was a, an intrusion on their body to be vaccinated. How do you do the trade-off? Not easy. Um, I, I don't know if there was a right answer to that. But when you're presenting stuff to a client, you don't know if they're going to be thinking on average for the firm, is this a really good thing? Or are they going to think about customers are going to be upset and post negative reviews online or potentially hurt my reputation or something like that? Or they're going to yell at me or I rejected a transaction and it was my boss's spouse or whatever that uh, so someone yells at me. I don't want that happening. The language you use in your presentation uh, may help reduce that type of thing. You're gonna, you need to communicate clear and concise fashion. So that's what we're gonna do next week. We're not gonna look at all the challenges you run into with implementation, but we will be looking at, at least from your stage, because someone else does the implementation, but you're gonna do, have deliverables at the end. You're going to have a report, maybe a presentation. You're going to have an implementation plan, some other types of documents. How do you prepare those deliverables for your client? And so that you can have a successful conclusion from the project from your perspective. And anyway, that's for next week. So we're all done. And hopefully it's, I can stop recording now. <laughs>